Hi, welcome to this lecture on, I'll call it web cracking theory. So here I'm going to introduce you to some of the background on exactly how web is broken and what kind of things we need to do in order to exploit those breaks. So like we've said before, web is broken. But today I want to talk about what are the flaws in web that cause all the trouble, what needs to be done in, in order to exploit those flaws. And hopefully this will give you enough background so that you understand the problems with web so you can think about them and reason about them and then also understand how the cracking tools actually work when you use them. So the first thing to talk about with web is the cipher that it uses. So web uses the RC4 cipher and RC4 is a stream cipher. And you may remember that the way a stream cipher works is you start with a key and you pass that through the stream cipher, in this case RC4, and it gives you key stream which is a pseudo-random string of bits. We take that pseudo-random string of bits and we combine it with the plain text. Now the way we combine it is with exclusive or. So we exclusive or key stream with plain text, the data we want to encrypt, and we get out our cipher text. So that's a stream cipher. Web uses a stream cipher. So the key, how does web choose the key? Well, there's a lot of moving things around, but in the beginning, uh, there's a 128-bit key that's chosen by the user in some way, usually on the router configuration or the router chooses it randomly and just tells it to the user, but it's 128 bits. And this is the key that you end up having to type in in hexadecimal when you want to connect to a web network. From that 128-bit key, four root keys are derived, and there are 104 bits each. It's just we do some sort of mathematical operation on the 128-bit key to produce four 104-bit root keys. But only the first root key is ever really used in practice. So four are generated, but only the first one is ever actually used. The other three were just there as part of the standard, but no one ended up using them. And when you encrypt a packet in web, the root key is combined with a 24-bit initial vector to provide the actual encryption key that's passed to RC4. And the IV should change for every packet. Because remember, when you use a stream cipher, you never want to reuse the same key because the same key results in the same key stream. And if you use the same key stream, an attacker could potentially exploit that against you. So they added a 24-bit initial vector into the key in order to make sure it changes for every packet. So how does WEP handle encrypting a packet? Well, we take our root key, which is the same used for every packet. We append the 24-bit initial vector and that, that, that as a whole is 128 bits. So we take that 128 bits and we use that as the key into RC4 and that produces key stream. And then we take our packet data, the stuff that we want to actually encrypt, we exclusive or it with the key stream and we get our encrypted packet data. Now we can't just take that encrypted packet data and transmit it wirelessly and expect something to happen because it's encrypted. There's no information that's you know visible to anybody listening as to who it's to, or things like that, because everything's encrypted. So we add a sort of header onto the front, and the header would control things like um, where this packet is going, you know, probably the MAC address of the router or the station that it's going to be transmitted to. And then also, because we've added this initial vector onto our root key when we did the encryption, if somebody's going to be able to decrypt this packet, they need to know the root key and the initial vector. Well, the root key is a secret. It's shared between access points and stations. Uh, but the initial vector is just chosen on a per packet basis. So we also have to include that initial vector in our header as a plain text. So we have a header, the initial vector, and then the encrypted packet data. And when somebody receives this packet, if they know the root key, they can combine the root key with the initial vector to generate the key stream. They can exclusive or the key stream with the encrypted data, and they'll get back the original plain text packet. So that is how WEP encrypts a packet. So RC4, the stream cipher, uh, has some problems. The first and the main issue is that it has mathematical weaknesses. Uh, and those mathematical weaknesses mean that you can derive the key by analyzing the key stream. So if you have enough of the key stream, you can derive the key in RC4. Now, normally you're not supposed to be able to do that for stream ciphers. Ideally with a stream cipher, you, you should not be able to start with key stream and get back to key. But RC4 has some mathematical weaknesses that allow that to happen. But it, you need a lot of key stream in order to do it. And because the key in this case changes with every packet because of that initial vector, we need lots of key stream that involves lots of initial vectors. 
So let's make an observation about the stream cipher real quick to notice so that we can think through what it means in order to get enough key stream to be able to do this. First, if I know a plain text cipher text pair, then I know the key stream because you know the key stream is exclusive word with the plain text to get the cipher text. So initially, this is how the operation works. Cipher text equals plain text exclusive word with the key stream. But I can solve that out, and I can solve for the key stream is equal to the cipher text exclusive word with the plain text. So if I know a plain text cipher text pair, then I know the key stream. But in general, like I said, knowing the key stream does not usually give me the key. But in the case of RC4, it could. So if I can get lots of plain text pairs, plain text ciphertext pairs, for various initial vectors that were used when encrypting the packets, I would have lots of key stream. And I could analyze it and determine the key because of the weaknesses in RC4. Now in this lecture, I'm not going to discuss uh, the mathematical weaknesses in RC4 because the math of it is not relevant to the type of course that we're, that we're engaging in right now. But uh, it's a mathematical analysis that's done in order to go from key stream to key. And it's based, again, on the weaknesses that RC4 has mathematically. So in the real world, where someone has WEP implemented on a router, how do I get plain text ciphertext pairs? I mean, getting ciphertext is easy because I can just sniff for it. I can take a wireless card, I can put it in monitor mode, and I can just have it listen and dump packets for whatever it sees. So ciphertext is no problem. But how do I learn the corresponding plain text? Well, that can be harder. So what I really wish is that there were some packets that were really frequently sent over the wireless that I knew the plain text for. It would be really convenient for me if there was some common networking packet that was transmitted frequently on this wireless network that, was, that I knew what it was, so I knew the plain text for it. Well, there is one, and it's ARP. So let's review ARP. ARP is a network level protocol for finding MAC addresses of local machines. In fact, ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol. And there are two types of ARP packets. Hopefully you're remembering this from some sort of networking background that I hope you've had. First, there's an ARP request, which is where a machine on the local hardware um, segment says, who is 192.168.122.5, for example. Just sends out a request of who has this IP address. And whoever has that IP will reply and say, I, I am, and they'll say that IP address. And in this, what, what, what you're trying to do is the two machines are trying to figure out each other's MAC addresses, the hardware addresses. Because remember, on the local network segment, packets are addressed using the MAC address, not the IP address. So if, you, so if the router has a packet to send to one of the other machines on the network, and all it knows is the IP address of that machine, it has to use an ARP request to find the MAC address of that machine. And that's what, this, that's what these ARP requests are for. So you have an ARP request, which is who, what MAC address has this IP, and an ARP reply that says, I have that IP. Now, ARP requests are sent by all computers on a local network, and, and a wireless access point builds effectively a wireless local network. And when a machine makes an ARP request, it caches the results so that it doesn't have to send one ARP request for every packet that it's transmitting. But it only caches the results for a few minutes. Um, and that's because there's a chance that what the machine associated with an IP address could change. So you don't want a stale cache that would cause you to misroute packets. So responses are cached, but not for very long. Um, and all ARP requests, all of them, have a predictable 16-byte header. So the first 16 bytes of any ARP request are very predictable. You can know, just based on the network, uh, what those 16 bytes should be. Same thing for ARP replies. They have the same predictable 16-byte header. So what? What's the significance of this? Well, this means that if I see an encrypted ARP request or ARP reply, I know the plain text for the first 16 bytes because it's predictable. Just because it's an ARP request and it's on this network, I can know what the first 16 bytes would be. So if I sniff an encrypted ARP request or an encrypted ARP reply, I know the plain text for those first 16 bytes. This is really good because that means that if I take the ARP request ciphertext that I sniffed off the network and the ARP request plain text that I predicted because ARP is predictable and I exclusive or them together, I'm going to get keystream. 
In fact, for every ARP request packet that I sniff, I can get 16 bytes of keystream because that's how much of the plain text that I know for certain on ARP. So 16 bytes of keystream for every ARP request that I sniff off of the network. That's pretty good, actually. So every ARP request that comes across the network, I can grab it and I can uh, predict what its plain text should be and then I can derive the keystream. Well, this is good. This gets me closer because I need chunks of keystream in order to predict the key. Well, how do I get ARP packets? I need between 30,000 and 100,000 plain text ciphertext pairs with unique initial vectors in order to find the key that was used for the encryption. I could just passively listen for encrypted packets. So I could just put my uh, wireless card in monitor mode, have it dump packets, and just wait until I've gotten between 30 and 100,000 of them. That could take a long time um, because ARP requests are frequent and you could potentially do a similar attack with other types of packets but it's not so frequent that this is going to happen all the time. So you could be waiting quite a while on the order of days or weeks to get enough packets. But the other option is I could just listen for one ARP request and then I could replay it back to the router as is. I don't even need to decrypt it because I can't, I don't know the key, but I could just replay the ciphertext as is back to the router and have it decrypt it and process it. Okay, so let's look at what that means. If I have an encrypted ARP packet and I send it back to the access point, the access point will decrypt it, analyze it, say, oh, this is an ARP request. I need to forward this on. And then it will resend it to the other stations on the network. And it resends because ARP packets, are, ARP requests at least, are broadcast packets. They're sent to everybody on the local network. So when the access point receives an ARP request packet from me, it thinks it needs to broadcast it to everybody else on the network. So it'll receive mine, re-encrypt it, and send it to everybody else. And when it does that re-encryption, it uses a new initial vector, which is good because I'm trying to get as many different packets with different initial vectors as I can. Okay, so how do I, first of all, get the initial ARP packet? How do I do my ARP sniffing? Well, I, if I'm the attacker here on the left, then all I'm going to do is I'm going to set my wireless card for monitor mode. And I've illustrated that here by just kind of using these two lines to show that I'm, I'm watching for anything that occurs in that area. And then let's say that the access point sends an ARP request out, and it's really targeting this machine over here, 192.168.122.5, but it's wireless, so that is broadcast everywhere. The attacker can see that ARP request that was sent and just keeps a copy of it. Now remember, this is encrypted, so the attacker can't decrypt it, but he just keeps a copy of the encrypted ARP request. And at this point, a lot of people say, well, if it's encrypted, how does the attacker know it's an ARP request? And that's a good question, but usually you pick it out based on the size of the packet. So data packets and such on most networks are fairly large because they're carrying lots of data. ARP requests tend to be small and of a specific size. So based on the specific size of the encrypted packet, uh, our attacker guesses that it's an ARP packet and saves a copy of it. Well then, the attacker says, well, I want to replay this packet in order to get more. So what does he do? He takes his stolen encrypted packet and he transmits it back to the access point. The access point receives it, processes it, says, oh, this is an ARP request. I better broadcast this. Re-encrypts it with a new initial vector. So remember, the, the original packet that I sniffed used, used you know, some initial vector, I'll call it IV1. This resend uses a different initial vector. I'll call it IV2. Then that ARP request packet goes down to the, the, to the machine that was, it was targeted for, who receives it, and then sends an ARP reply. You know, I am, whatever that IP address is. And that ARP reply is encrypted with another initial vector. So that's good. So far I have three different initial vectors. And ARP replies and ARP requests both have that same predictability for the first 16 bytes. So that packet's useful for me too, in terms of my ability to get keystream. So that, that reply goes to the access point, and the access point says, oh, well, that's a broadcast packet, and sends it out again. So I see that as well with another initial vector. So if I send one sniffed packet, I get three packets with new initial vectors. So for every one that I send, I get three new ones. And if I resend the same one after this, I'll get three more new initial vectors, because ideally the router and the clients won't be reusing the initial vectors, I'll keep getting new ones. So I can keep resending this same ARP request that I sniffed, and every time I do, I'll get three new 
packets that are useful for me for building up my, you know, my chunk of data that I need to analyze. So I send one, I get back three. And the tools that do this can actually send pretty fast. The common rate is 500 packets per second. So I can send 500 replayed ARP requests per second and get back lots of replies. So why did this happen? I mean, as I describe the issue and, and how we figured out how to break it, we should always stop and say, well, how did this happen? Why wasn't this designed properly? Why were these mistakes there? Uh, the first is that RC4, the stream cipher, was not properly peer reviewed. So it was designed by one guy. He was really, really smart. Um, in fact, he was Ron Rivest, one of the men who invented RSA, which is modern public key cryptography, potentially one of the best cryptographers in the world. He designed RC4, um, but he designed it himself, and he's only one person. And so uh, he didn't open it up for peer review, and he, he kept it a secret for a while. He used it in a company that he was, that he was running. And so it was not properly peer reviewed by other cryptographers in the community until later, until after it had already been deployed and used in, uh, widely. After people started to analyze it, they began to find flaws and mistakes in it, such as the mathematical weakness that allows us to derive the key from the key stream. The second problem was that the web standard was not properly peer reviewed. So the web standard was designed by uh, the wireless alliance that was putting together the Wi-Fi standards, and they brought in security people. But the standard itself was not properly peer reviewed, and so these, this, the, some of the flaws in the way WEP was implemented also made it into the standard and weren't caught until after it had been released and widely deployed. Uh, another issue is that wireless traffic in general has a lot of dynamics that make it hard to do cryptography right. So for example, these ARP requests with the same 16 byte headers, well, that's something that's kind of unique to to, pet, to networking, right? I mean, a lot of implementations of cryptography wouldn't have a situation where it's really easy to get plain text ciphertext pairs. But in this case, it is really easy to get plain text ciphertext pairs. And so instead of, instead of the attacker having to perform a ciphertext only attack and get the key, the attacker gets to perform a known plain text attack and get the key, which is effectively what's happening here. He gets lots and lots of plain text ciphertext pairs and uses those. So overall, as you look at what happened in the design of web, the biggest issue was that not enough smart people looked at it. It wasn't open enough for peer review. And so because of that, it got released with flaws. And then when peer review did happen after it had been widely deployed, it was too late to really fix it. Because once you have thousands or even tens of thousands of wireless routers that have been sold and in use with web on them, you can't just patch the standard and move on because all of those routers would become obsolete. So it becomes this really painful situation. So let's summarize. Uh, first, WEP is easy to break. Uh, and the reason it's easy to break is because RC4 has mathematical weaknesses. Um, WEP uses the initial vector in a bad way by making it part of the key in the way that it did. Uh, it's really easy to predict the plain text for many packets on a network, like the ARP packets, which further makes the attack easier. Uh, and so, finally, I'll just say, don't use WEP for anything except laughs. Like, don't, don't actually use it for any sort of serious security on a network. So thanks. I hope this was helpful.